All right, the gospel. The gospel lesson begins with Jesus talking to his disciples about his upcoming suffering and death. This is the second time that Jesus has told them about his upcoming betrayal, suffering, and death. But Mark records that the disciples did not understand. This was not the first, nor it would be the last time that the disciples would not understand, that they just won't get it. The disciples have received answers to their questions. They have seen glimpses of Jesus' glory in the transfiguration. They have witnessed his miraculous healings, but they are still unable to understand the truth of his teaching and the reality of Jesus' suffering and death. The fact of the matter is that the disciples will not understand who Jesus is and what discipleship means until after the crucifixion and resurrection. When Jesus and his disciples arrive at Capernaum, Jesus asks his followers what they were arguing about on the road. Well, there's this awkward silence because the disciples are embarrassed. Their discussion was not as one might have thought about Jesus' death. That might have upset them and concerned them and had a big discussion, but no. Rather, their big discussion was about the disciples' preoccupation among themselves, who was the greatest. The disciples are human, just like you and I. They are filled with human weakness, such as the desire to stand out and to be the favorite. We want to be the greatest. What young person does not want to be a rock star or a celebrity of some kind? There's nothing really wrong, you know, with wanting to stand out from our peers as long as it does not cause us to mistreat others or to betray our values. It takes ambitious people to get things done. And Jesus warns us, though, to be ambitious in the right way. From last week's gospel lesson, we heard how the disciples did not understand the teaching of Jesus after his first passion prediction. Nor did they understand when Jesus said, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. By discussing who was the greatest, they were asserting themselves, not denying themselves. So while Jesus is traveling to his death in Jerusalem, the disciples are only concerned about their personal success and their rank in society. The disciples are still operating from a worldly view with worldly values. When Peter confesses that Jesus is the Messiah, he understands that Jesus is about to lead an army to overthrow the Romans and to become king of Israel. That's what he gets. And they are going to be there with Jesus. The disciples are going to be there with him, sharing in the glory and the rewards of such a position. Peter and the other disciples are all imagining they're going to have a mansion in Jerusalem. And they're going to have a summer house in the Judean foothills, filled with servants of every kind and all those great things that make for a good life. The disciples expected that following Jesus would eventually lead to wealth and power for them all, and, and for some more than others. They were all looking to be stars, celebrities of their day. But Jesus confuses the disciples when he says that he will be betrayed and he's going to suffer and he's going to die. Disciples do not realize yet that there is much more than earthly power at work in Jesus. Jesus is bringing a whole new way of thinking about things and how people should relate to one another. So Jesus sits down. He, he calls the 12 disciples to gather around him and he says to them, whoever wants to be first must be last, must be last of all and servant of all. Now Jesus seems to be saying a contradiction. To be first, you must be last. He insists to be a star, well, then you've got to be a servant. And to illustrate this, Countercultural career advice more clearly, Jesus takes a child in his arms and says, whoever welcomes one such child in, the name, in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes not just me, but the one who sent me, namely God. The jaws of the disciples drop to the floor at this point because in the first century, a child is a non-person, a non-entity, a nobody. 
The only people lower than a child would be a slave. In fact, children were practically speaking a slave to his or her father, or they could be sold into slavery. Children were nearly worthless. When Jesus fed the 5,000, he fed 5,000 men, but possibly twice as many women and children. We do not say the feeding of the 10,000 because literally women and children did not count in Jesus' day. They were considered the property of a man, just like a dog or a goat, and the man could do whatever he wanted with them. Perhaps the equivalent shock today would be if Jesus took a homeless person and put him or her in his arms before the disciples and said, whoever welcomes one such as this welcomes me and the God who sent me. Decent people with relative wealth would be shocked at what Jesus said. Disciples were even more shocked by his praise of children. There is no reason for a little child to come close to a great teacher such as Jesus, or even in a group of a middle of men who are obviously doing something important, and children had no business being there, but Jesus takes a child in the midst of them. Children, you know, were meant to stay with the women and to keep, uh, keep themselves out of the way. Thus to say that the followers of Jesus could welcome him by welcoming a child was just a mind-blowing suggestion. Jesus is saying, when you welcome a nobody, you welcome me. And when you welcome me, you welcome God. So if you want to be first in the kingdom of God, well, you better get used to being a welcoming servant of all people. And Jesus wanted them to understand how God viewed greatness. It came not from being high on, society, on society's status ladder, but by welcoming those at the bottom rungs or those who don't even have a place in the ladder at all. Jesus is calling us to flip our usual attitudes toward greatness and honor and fame completely upside down. Our normal perspective is to look at life from the top down, you know, giving our greatest attention to the people who have completed uh, with who have competed with one another to get to the top. And the top being wealth, fame, and power. We look you know, to dancers and singers, to actors and artists and sports athletes, as well as some politicians and business leaders. You know, we go gaga for celebrities these days. Literally, gaga. We are drawn into their fame. We are impressed by their talents, their accomplishments, and their wealth. But Jesus is saying, change your perspective. Greatness is not measured by your wealth or power or celebrity. It is not measured by what you get, it's by measured by what you give. Serving others is the measure of greatness. Jesus says, look at life from the bottom up and give your greatest attention to the people who have no fame or status. Focus on children, on single mothers, cab drivers or dishwashers, on chambermaids, on the working poor or on the homeless. Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me, says Jesus, and whoever welcomes me welcomes God. Evangelist Bill Glass, he used to, he used to play for the Detroit Lions and uh, Cleveland Browns. And he became an evangelist, but instead of football, he talks about the baseball game of life. And he says that there are three bases which a Christian needs to touch before crossing home plate. We all know who, how, what home plate is. Okay. First base is salvation. Knowing that you are saved by Christ. The second base is sanctification, or the growing into the likeness of Christ. And the third base is service. Now, Bill Glass says that there are far too many people who only touch the first base salvation without tagging the second and the third basis. When we accept Christ as Lord and Savior, that is only the beginning of our journey. Our journey is to grow closer to God and become more like Jesus. That's, that's our second base. That's just as much a part of being a Christian as salvation is. Salvation is just the beginning of the journey. Growing to be more like Jesus is a continuation in the process. And the thing that makes you the greatest is humbling yourself to serve others, especially those who do not know the amazing grace of God. And to serve others as Christ would have us serve 
is to respect them and treat them with dignity. We act in harmony with God's will whenever we treat people with dignity that they deserve as people who are made in the image of God and are being, well, they are a child of God. In California, there is an annual march for human dignity, which includes an underwear drive for the homeless. Hundreds of volunteers collect thousands of pairs of underwear and socks for people served by the Los Angeles Mission. Mission chairperson Herb Smith says, while many may look at this as something of a joke, we take it very seriously. To us and to our guests, respect is the most important subject. When we treat people with dignity, they begin the process of retaining their self-respect. And over time, that can result in recovery and self-sufficiency. The gift of a clean pair of underwear can help a homeless person regain a sense of self-respect. It can be an important step in recovery and self-sufficiency. It is a small but significant one, one that treats the people on our streets with the dignity that they deserve as children of God. To serve a child, a homeless person, to serve Jesus. And to welcome such a brother or sister is to welcome God who sent Jesus into the world. This bottom-up approach to greatness will never earn us fame or put us in the spotlight, but it will move us ever closer to the light of God's eternal kingdom. From a worldly perspective, for us to be called great, would mean that there are others who do not measure up to our social status or to our financial bank accounts or our recognition achievement and who are therefore less than we are. Jesus was not taking issue with the idea of measurement. There's certainly measurement in the world to determine greatness. He was simply saying that the disciples were measuring in the wrong direction. True greatness is not from how far we rise above others in status or fame or achievement. It is in how far we are willing to go to include and care for the least and lowly in his name. Far from calling for a leveling of humankind, Jesus was urging his followers to stand tall in their recognition of every person, even the most decrepit among us, as someone for whom he came to serve and to die for. Thus, in welcoming one who has little in the way of worldly status, they and we welcome Jesus. And in welcoming Jesus, we welcome God. Jesus ties the word greatness to the word welcome. Welcoming is an aspect of hospitality, the cordial and generous reception of others as guests. It is one thing to try to help others from a distance to throw you know, them our leftovers or our hand-me-downs. But it's quite another to give them the kinds of things that we also value and enjoy. And that's what Jesus did. He understood that his own destiny as the Messiah was not the way of worldly glory or, or greatness, but the path to service and sacrifice. Jesus gave him of himself in a way that did not elevate him high above the world, but instead enmeshed him down in the world, in the tapestry of life-changing and, and life-giving relationships with other people and with God. The question is, is not who is the greatest, but instead, how can we cooperate with God's will to achieve the greatest good? As it is so often the case, Jesus shows us the way. In 2003, the Food and Drug Administration approved the use of injections of human growth hormone for healthy children who are simply short. Four years of shots could add an extra three inches to an individual's final measurement. So the human height average may go up a bit, and injections may be the way to get there. We may have found a way to grow tall physically, but for growing tall spiritually, the, pres the prescription remains unchanged. The long and short of it is to be hospitable toward the least and lowly, and in doing so, we welcome Christ. True greatness results not from how far we rise above others, but in how far we are willing to go 
to include and care for the least and lowly. In Christ's name, amen.